Okay, so hi guys, you can see my costume. Um, hold on, let me show you the entire costume. Here we go. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, let me turn on the light for you guys. All right, so here's my scepter. And here I am with the whole costume. So yes, I am Mickey Mouse as the sorcerer. Okay. So today we will be talking about body paragraph three for your argumentative essay and how to correct run on sentences. Now, give me a second. Let me get the share screen going so you guys can actually see uh, my, power, my PowerPoint. Okay. Shouldn't be a five minute break for this one. Like I did last time. Hopefully, you guys figured it out. And here we have slides. Again, I hope everyone's doing okay. Hopefully, good, but okay, I'll take two. All right, so we've got body paragraph, and this is body paragraph three argument of essay with counterclaim. All right, so. You guys now have done an introduction. You've done body paragraph one. You've done body paragraph two. You should have to be up to three paragraphs. Now we're on our fourth paragraph, but third body paragraph. Okay. Now this one may be one of your harder ones because this one actually does the counterclaim. We did discuss this before we left um, our building for school. So I'm gonna use the same one we discussed. So hopefully it like triggers what we talked about, maybe a little bit more. So now let's go, let's go ahead and get this started. So I can actually see, I actually made an error. So right here, counterclaim is actually the first thing that's going to be in your essay or in your paragraph, I'm sorry. So the counterclaim is an opposing viewpoint from oh, opposing viewpoint toward your thesis statement, okay? So this will not support your thesis statement because you're going to argue against this counterclaim, all right? So that's important to note. This will not support your original thesis statement, which was at the beginning of um, in your first introduction paragraph. The next thing is gonna be a concession. This is where you say, okay, the opposing side has, they have something to say, what they're saying is not wrong, but, and this the, that's where the refute comes in, but it doesn't matter to what I'm talking about. And that's kind of the whole point. The refute is the but. Yeah, you have a valid point, but it doesn't matter to my thesis statement. And that's basically what you are doing here. So now let's continue. All right, so again, this counterclaim opposes your thesis statement. Don't forget that, opposes, it's the opposite. It does not agree with you. So the thesis statement for what we did in class was fiction, including stories, novels, and films, is a great way to teach people about history. And John Boyne's The Boy in the Striped Pajamas is an excellent example. That right there is a thesis statement that the counterclaim will need to oppose. I'll need to go against that. So now let's look at four. Your counterclaim example with hard evidence. Now your counterclaim example, I want it to have some hard evidence. Or your refute have hard evidence. You need to have hard evidence in one or the other. Not necessarily both. But at least one or the other. So critics like David Cesarani argue that Bruno's innocence is unrealistic. A nine-year-old boy in wartime Germany would clearly understand the purpose of the camp and why Schmuel was there. 
this contraclaim goes against the original thesis statement that actually says historical fiction is good to use for teaching um, for teaching English, okay? And now, reminder, hard evidence is used the rhetorical devices, pathos, logos, or ethos with a source. Again, your bet, your, actually I didn't say this before, but if you have hard evidence in both your counterclaim and your refute, uh, you're gonna have a very strong argument. So I would attempt to do that. Now, don't forget your source. Where did the information come from? That's your, how you know you have hard evidence because you have a source. Example, the LA Times. All right, so concession for the counterclaim. This is merely saying, all right, you're the opposite side. You don't, you aren't agreeing with I'm saying. You, you, what you said could be true. I'm not arguing the validity of your point, okay? So that's what you're saying. You're acknowledging what they have to say as maybe a fact, what they have to say maybe is important. It doesn't matter. You're just acknowledging it. Okay, so the concession for this counterclaim is that may be true. This is in response to the counterclaim that we just read. Now the author, who is you, is acknowledging the opposing side of the argument has a valid point. Just acknowledging, that's it. Again, that may only be one simple sentence as I've showed you. Now we go on to the refute to the counterclaim. So the refute is where you're saying why their evidence or their reason doesn't matter. You have to tell them why it doesn't matter. So, but these critics are missing the point. As Claudia Moscovici notes in her literature blog, the subtitle clearly indicates that the boy in the striped pajamas is a fable. By its own admission, Moscovici argues this novel doesn't propose to offer a realistic historical account of the Holocaust. Fables are not history. Fables are designed to explore moral lessons. Again, this is where you're making the disagreeing side counterclaim invalid and irrelevant. Okay, and it, like, like we acknowledge that it may be true a nine-year-old in wartime journey may have known why Schmuel was in the actual camp, but it doesn't matter because this story has always been a fable. The author never said that this was true to life. And that's why the counterclaim doesn't matter, okay? So you're making the other point not matter. Just think of it that way. So let's put it together into a paragraph. Critics like, this includes your counterclaim, your concession, your refute. This is gonna be your paragraph three, or uh, your body paragraph three. Critics like David Sesterani agree, argue that Bruno's innocence is unrealistic. A nine-year-old boy in wartime Germany would clearly understand the purpose of the camp and why Schmuel was there. This would be particularly true for the son of a high-ranking Nazi. This may, that may be true. But these critics are missing the point. As Claudia Moscovici notes in her literature blog, the subtitle clearly indicates the boy in the striped pajamas is a fable. By its own admission, Moscovici argues this novel doesn't propose to offer a realistic historical account of the Holocaust. Fables are not history. Fables are designed to explore moral lessons. So let's go back up here real quick. So what we did is we put our counterclaim example with hard evidence. Then we added in our concession. Then we added in our refute. And then we have a paragraph. Okay. So that's what I'm looking for. And again, I know this may be the most challenging one. It doesn't matter. I want you to try because the more you try, the better you get. Okay, so we're gonna end that PowerPoint right now. And we'll go to, let's see, go to my other PowerPoint. This one will be a little quicker. So this one is about run on sentences, which is an issue with too when you got too much writing of your guys's. I don't know if I said that very well, but that's okay. All right, so we're gonna go over run on sentences. There is an, there is an assignment in Google Classroom for you to do, but here is the PowerPoint. Okay, so a run on sentence definition. Oh, got the I. Nice, I can fix these right now. A run-on sentence occurs when two sentences 
are run together. Oh, sorry, come on guys, let me put an S there. The desk off, there we go. Are run together with no adequate sign to mark the break between them. Okay, so really they should be either two, well, there's different ways to deal with a run on sentence. So let's look at the first way. Okay, our example number one is to make them into two sentences. So let's look at our run on. A man coughed in the movie theater. The result was a chain reaction of copycat coughing. Copycat coughing. That is incorrect. That's a run-on sentence. Let's look how it was fixed. A man coughed in the movie theater. The result was a chain reaction of copycat coughing. So that uh, basically we now have two sentences and it's not a run-on anymore. The run-on has been corrected by using a period and a capital letter to separate the two complete thoughts. So think of it as complete thoughts. That's the big issue of how you get run-ons because you have two complete thoughts or more. Run-on example number two. I heard the laughter inside the house. No one answered the bell. Incorrect. Run-on sentence. Correct. I heard laughter inside the house, but no one answered the bell. You'll notice a, a but there, transition word. Keep, I want you guys to use those. So the run on has been corrected by using a joining word, but to connect the two complete thoughts. Also, the comma. Don't forget the comma. Okay, that's our next one. And this one, are still probably many adults who aren't comfortable with this one, but I still wanna show it to you. A car sped around the corner, it sprayed slush all over the pedestrians. I didn't correct it right. So basically this would be, I don't know why I didn't put a semicolon. Okay, so a car sped around the corner. Yes, it did to put a semicolon. It sprayed slush all over the pedestrians. Okay, so this one, when do you use a semicolon besides doing two sentences? To be honest, it's not real distinct. You just kind of feel these two thoughts need to be together. So that's why you put a semicolon. But if you keep them together, they're not going to, they're going to be a run-on sentence. So um, the run-on has been corrected by using a semicolon to connect the two closely related thoughts. It's really a manner of writing or form. Um, your most most your run on sentences can honestly most time be fixed with either um, a period making two sentences or a comma you don't have to use semicolons but it is a way of making your writing more sophisticated for those of you who are interested uh now um i had a campus map i still could not find my classroom building so this one, this goes actually back to um, what you guys actually were doing earlier, which those um, uh, word depend, those dependent words. So although I had a campus map, I still could not find my classroom building. This run-in has been corrected by using the subordinating word, although, to connect the two closely related thoughts. So even with the comma, it's still a run-on sentence. You need the although to make it not a run on sentence. So <clears throat> anyway, those are ways of correcting them. Now your first practice, um, they actually can all be corrected pretty much through two sentences. But if you do correct them the other ways, that is okay. Um, but you need to find where that break is. So that is your other assignment. And again, these will be posted so you can look at them. And anyway, I see anything else. So let's go over one more time before I let you go. You need to do your third body paragraph. Uh, this week I will be putting grades into PowerPoint. I've been keeping track on, just to let you know, my little sheets here. I've been checking off when you've been doing your work. Yes, they're handwritten. And some of you need to check because I did return some items because they were incomplete. All right, and then you also um, listen to, need to listen to Macbeth. I still have not tried to do the PDF. I will see if I can still get that done. And then practice your correcting run on sentences, and that means I shouldn't see any run on sentences in your essay. All right, so uh, tomorrow, 
two to three. See you in the Zoom meeting. And I will be wearing a different hat tomorrow.